All right, guys, this is going to be chapter 14. It's going to cover caring for cardiac emergencies. Objectives of this chapter are to review cardiovascular anatomy and physiology. We're also going to define the following terms. Angina, cardiac compromise, conduction pathway, heart failure, myocardial infarction, we're going to describe the normal blood flow through the heart, explain the common causes of cardiac compromise, describe the signs and symptoms of a patient experiencing cardiac compromise, differentiate and explain the pathophysiology of angina, myocardial infarction, and heart failure, explain the appropriate assessment and care for a patient experiencing cardiac compromise, Demonstrate the ability to appropriately assess and care for a patient experiencing cardiac compromise. Value the importance of caring for all patients with chest pain as though it were a cardiac compromise. Alright, normal heart function. All right, so the heart beats about 100,000 times a day, and it also pumps about 6,000 to 7,500 liters of blood through the body each day. Just something to think about. Um, so 6,000 liters is roughly equal to about 2,000 gallons. All right, how many gallons of water does your fire engine hold? My, most of them anywhere from 750 to to um, 750 to 1000 gallons of water so your heart is pumping double what one pumper will hold as far as water goes in your um, fire engine all right so here's another thing to think about blocking part of a garden hose increases the water pressure in a similar way blocked blood vessels contribute to high blood pressure that's also a risk factor for um, heart attack and stroke. All right, so the coronary arteries supply blood to the heart muscle, or also known as the myocardium, is what the heart muscle is known as. So you'll see the labels there on the left-hand side of your screen. You can see a label that says right coronary artery. It's coming straight off the aorta right there. The aorta is going to be the bright red large vessel. You can see the coronary artery is coming off the aorta as well. And then it branches off into other sections. All right, so the cardiac cycle. Blood flows from the body into the right atrium, down into the right ventricle, and then it gets pumped to the lungs. Blood exits the, exits the lungs and enters the left atrium and then flows into the left ventricle. Once the blood exits the left ventricle, it flows out to the body and the cycle starts over. Alright, this uh, image shows the major anatomy of the heart and it also shows the blood flow through the chambers. We'll go through the blood flow going through the heart. If you'll just follow along with me, we're going to start at the top of the image uh, where it says from the body we're going to look at the superior vena cava all right so the superior vena cava is where most of your blood from your body uh, is going to come back this is going to be deoxygenated blood that's already given off all of its oxygen to the tissues all right so we're going to start our journey in the superior vena cava all right we're going to pass from the superior vena cava directly into the right atrium um, after we go to the right atrium, we're going to move into the right ventricle. To enter the right ventricle, we're going to have to go through the tricuspid valve. Uh, we'll get into more about your valves and everything when we get into your EMT portion of this class, but just know it's a valve that separates the right atrium from the right ventricle. So, like I said before, all this blood is deoxygenated. Uh, it doesn't mean it has no oxygen, it has just less oxygen than the other blood in your body going out to the rest of the body. Alright, so from the right ventricle, we're going to pass through the um, pulmonic valve, which is going to lead into our pulmonary trunk. 
Those then split off into your left and right pulmonary artery. Uh, just keep in mind that the pulmonary arteries are the only arteries in the body that transport deoxygenated blood. All right. So these pulmonary arteries, if you think about your medical terminology, you're going to terminology you're going to transport the deoxygenated blood to the lungs all right so when it comes back from the lungs if you'll look on the right side of the screen you'll see a heading that says from the lung it'll say left pulmonary vein branches so after the blood is oxygenated in the lungs Actually, you know, in your alveoli is where gas exchange occurs, your capillaries and your alveoli. It's going to come back to the heart via the pulmonary veins. All right. Another talking point. These are the only veins in the body that are going to carry blood that has been oxygenated from the heart and has not dropped off oxygen in any other tissues of the body. All right. From there, we're going to move into the left atrium. To get from the left atrium into the left ventricle, we're going to pass through the bicuspid valve. Again, we'll get into this valve a little bit more in detail in your EMT course. Um, after you come from the um, left ventricle, it's going to be pumped directly into your aorta. And after that, it's going to go into your um, descending aorta to the systemic circulation or basically just to the rest of your body. The book does a pretty good job of explaining this as well. Spend some time, go over it. This image is in your book. You need to pay close attention and memorize the blood flow through the heart. Alright, so the conduction pathway is the core of the electrical system that keeps the heart beating and the cardiac cycle going. Damage to the conduction pathway can lead to an abnormal heart rhythm and is a common cause of poor circulation and perfusion. This is an image showing the uh, conduction pathway of the heart. Uh, it's all going to be highlighted in green. So you've got the, uh, let's start off with the uh, sinoatrial node, also known as the SA node. Um, see it's located in the top of the right atrium up there. It's going to be the primary pacemaker of the heart. The SA node is going to stimulate the heart to beat anywhere from 60 to 100 beats per minute. Uh, we would consider that normal. After you leave the SA node, you're going to move down to the atrioventricular node, uh, most commonly known as the AV node. It's going to be located just inferior to the SA node, and you can see the pathways between the two. This is going to be your backup pacemaker for your um, SA node. It's going to have an intrinsic rate or a normal rate of about um, 40 to 60 beats per minute. Uh, that would be considered normal for that particular node if the SA node was not firing. Um, after that, we're going to skip over a couple of the different things that aren't listed here we'll pick up with them in the EMT class but those are your two major pacemakers of the heart the fastest one is always going to prevail if you move down to where it splits right here you've got another um, spot that we'll talk about later and then as it branches off that's what's actually going to depolarize and cause your ventricles to contract and pump blood to your lungs as well as the rest of your body um, I don't want to go too in-depth into this. It's just not something that's going to be covered in the class. Just keep in mind, this is what keeps your heart going, and this is what determines the rate that your heart's beating at. All right, so the heart is a big muscle with a big job to do. We already talked about how much blood the blo uh, heart pumps through your body daily. It's, it's an awful lot of volume. Problems can arise that affect the heart tissue and or the electrical system. Let's talk about cardiac compromise. All right, uh, some symptoms of cardiac compromise include chest discomfort, diaphoresis, which is sweating, dyspnea, which is shortness of breath, nausea, vomiting, anxiety or irritability, an abnormal pulse, abnormal blood pressure, 
and just a generalized feeling of impending doom. A lot of times people will just say, I feel like I'm going to die. If anybody ever tells you that, you really need to listen to them because a lot of times they're really on the right track. Um, let's see. A heart attack, also known as a myocardial infarction, occurs when the blood supply to part of the heart muscle is severely reduced or stopped because one of the coronary arteries that supplies blood to the heart muscle is blocked. The blockage is usually from the buildup of plaque due to atherosclerosis that can eventually tear or rupture, triggering a blood clot that blocks the artery and leads to a heart attack. The most common symptom of a heart attack is chest pain or angina. These sensations may extend into the neck, the jaw, and down the left arm. Angina is often associated with excessive sweating, feelings of apprehension, nausea, shortness of breath, and weakness. Some heart attacks are sudden and intense, but most heart attacks start slowly, with mild pain or discomfort. Often the people affected are not sure of what is happening and wait too long before getting help. Heart attack victims can benefit from new medications and treatments, such as clot-busting drugs, that can stop some heart attacks in progress, reducing disability and saving lives. To be effective, these drugs must be given relatively quickly after heart attack symptoms first appear. The average heart attack victim waits three hours after symptoms occur to seek help. Many times... All right, angina pectoris. Angina pectoris is uh, commonly referred to as just angina. It's going to be pain in the chest. Uh, it's caused by a decreased oxygen blood supply in the coronary arteries, leading to an increased oxygen blood demand in the heart muscle. It's going to be caused by exertion, by a partial blockage, or a spasm of one of the coronary arteries. The signs and symptoms of angina are nearly identical to a heart attack. The only difference is no actual damage is occurring to the heart muscle. A lot of times this is just because it's transient. It doesn't uh, completely block the coronary artery for a long time. Patients with angina history typically carry nitroglycerin, which is a vasodilator. Basically, it makes the uh, coronary artery larger and allows blood to go uh, to the cardiac muscle easier. Uh, treatment for angina and a myocardial infarction, which we know is a heart attack, is exactly the same. All right, so think about this, guys. Angina triggered by exertion is often resolved with rest where a myocardial infarction or a heart attack will not resolve with rest. EMRs should never cancel responding EMS, even if the patient claims relief. Go ahead and get some more advanced providers out there. Let them do an assessment and figure out what's going on with the patient before you cancel anybody. Angina pectoris means, literally, a pain in the chest. Coronary artery disease has narrowed the arteries that supply the heart. During times of exertion or stress, the heart works harder. The portion of the myocardium supplied by the narrowed artery becomes starved for oxygen. When the myocardium is deprived of oxygen, chest pain, angina pectoris, is the result. Nitroglycerin is a medication that dilates the blood vessels. Nitroglycerin is available in tablets that are placed under the patient's tongue to dissolve. It is also available in sprays and patches. Patients are often instructed by their physicians to take up to three doses of nitroglycerin over 10 minutes when chest pain occurs. This results in more blood staying in the veins of the body, so there is less blood coming back to the heart. With less blood to pump out, the heart does not have to work as hard. If there is no relief of symptoms after that time, patients are advised to call 911 if they continue to. All right, let's talk about a myocardial infarction. Uh, myocardial infarctions are MIs. Um, myo means muscle, cardial means heart. 
An infarction means tissue death. These are caused by a blockage or narrowing of the coronary artery, and it leads to a permanent decrease in oxygenated blood supply. Uh, if you don't have oxygenated blood going to the heart, the tissue um, that's affected begins to die. Typical signs and symptoms are going to include pain, pressure, tightness or heavier to the chest or upper abdomen. Uh, I generally, if somebody's having an abnormal sensation in their chest or upper abdomen, regardless of how they're actually describing it, remember that's subjective and can vary depending uh, on person to person. I'm going to assume it's a heart attack until proven otherwise. All right, so sometimes people present with atypical signs and symptoms. Um, by atypical, it means just not normal. Sometimes you'll see individuals present with flu-like symptoms, such as nausea and vomiting. Others say they just feel like they have indigestion. Sometimes people just generally feel weak. Um, Takeaway from this is don't generally cancel your responders just because you think Oh, they just got the flu. Oh, they just don't feel good. Let some more advanced providers come out, do a more thorough examination, and you can kind of get, go from there. But MIs can definitely present in different ways, especially with elderly people and diabetics. Also, women just generally present atypically. It's just something to keep in mind. All right, so... Heart attacks uh, with large amounts of tissue death or damage over an important electrical pathway may lead to cardiac arrest. So cardiac arrest, as we know, is what we treat with CPR. Patients in cardiac arrest are always unresponsive and not breathing, and they have no pulse. Just uh, something to think about. Uh, a lot of people, especially laypersons, will hear heart attack and you assume cardiac arrest cardiac arrest and heart attack are two completely different things Um, heart attack or a myocardial infarction is just a blockage of the um, one of the coronary arteries that's going to cause the blood flow to be impeded to a particular area of the heart and that can cause tissue damage and death Um, cardiac arrest is a unresponsive patient that is not breathing and has no pulse Right, this is figure 14.4 it's in your book. It just gives some uh, distinguishing, uh, some ways to distinguish angina pectoris from a myocardial infarction. As an EMR, you're not really going to be concerned with trying to differentiate this. Chest pain is chest pain, um, and it's chest pain with a cardiac etiology or a cardiac cause until proven otherwise. All right, so here's some. Uh, just a little information. So the location of the discomfort for angina is going to be substernal or all the way across the chest. A myocardial infarction or heart attack can be the same. All right. Uh, they can both radiate to the neck, jaw, arms, back, and shoulders. Uh, the nature of the discomfort can be dull or heavy with a pressure or squeezing sensation. Uh, it can be the same for both. And you got to remember it's always subjective, so it's hard to differentiate that. Uh, angina generally lasts 2 to 15 minutes, and it subsides after the activity stops. A heart attack is going to last longer than 10 minutes, and it generally does not self-relieve. Uh, angina really doesn't have any additional signs and symptoms however a myocardial infarction or a heart attack will present with perspiration or diaphoresis as we know is the same thing a pale gray color nausea weakness dizziness and lightheadedness some some precipitating uh, factors can include extremes in weather exertion stress meals a lot of times no Nothing occurs prior to a heart attack or myocardial infarction. Sometimes it does. Factors that give relief uh, for angina. One of the biggest things that gives relief is stopping physical activity and reducing the stress on the heart. Oftentimes, individuals that have angina will carry nitroglycerin. 
that will give relief. Um, with a heart attack, nitroglycerin is generally going to give incomplete or no relief of the pain. Uh, how, nitroglycerin works by enlarging the diameter of the blood vessel. And sometimes, depending on the severity of the um, blockage in the coronary artery, it can allow some blood to go around the coronary artery blockage and get to some of the heart and allow it to be perfused. More times than none, it's not going to work very well, but it can help. Takeaway from this slide is you can't really determine if it's angina or a myocardial infarction. Don't cancel anybody. Get the paramedics out there. Let them do an evaluation and go from there. All right, so heart failure. Uh, congestive heart failure is a weakened heart muscle, and it's unable to pump blood effectively and manage normal blood volume. It can be chronic due to cardiac disease, uh, or it can be sudden after a myocardial infarction or a heart attack. All right, so some uh, issues with congestive heart failure is that fluid backs up within the circulatory system. Uh, this fluid can back up into the lungs and also the lower extremities. If you've got somebody with heart failure, a lot of times you're going to see just gross edema in the lower extremities. And they'll just be uh, very swollen. They can even get to the point where they're leaking fluid through the skin. The lungs, um, you'll hear some different lung sounds. Their lungs will sound wet is what you'll hear a lot of people say. Uh, the actual terminology would be crackles. Uh, we'll go over that in class a little bit. I believe that's a little beyond the scope of this class. So. All right, so some signs and symptoms of heart failure that you're going to be looking for would be shortness of breath, chest pain or discomfort, a rapid heart rate, pedal edema, which is swollen ankles and lower legs, jugular venous distension, which is going to be the necks that are, I mean, the veins that are visible, um, on your neck will be really distended and extremely visible sometimes in these patients. You have pale, moist skin, and sometimes in more severe um, circumstances, you'll have altered mental status as well. All right, so patients with shortness of breath may have difficulty speaking, answering questions. That's one good way to tell if somebody's having shortness of breath is, are they able to answer my questions without taking, you know, breaths in between? So why do you think, um, or why do people experience a shortness of breath usually prefer an upright position? I mean, it's a simple answer. It's just easier to breathe while sitting up, especially if you have some type of compromise that's causing you to have trouble breathing. It's just easier for them to breathe sitting up. It, you're going to have a hard time getting somebody who's having truly, uh, true difficulty breathing to lay down flat. It just makes it extremely hard for them to breathe. In this view of the heart and lungs, it can be seen that a decrease in left ventricular function, for example, secondary to an MI or hypertension, results in a reduced forward flow of blood into the aorta and a backup of blood and pressure into the pulmonary vasculature. An increase in pulmonary capillary pressure results in the accumulation of fluid in the interstitial spaces around the bronchioles and lung vasculature. And All right, this is uh, what they were talking about with jugular venous distension. If you look at the just bulging vein on this gentleman's neck. All right, this is a example of pedal edema. If you'll just look at the just massive gross swelling of her lower extremities. They're checking um, the severity of the edema. It's going to be able to tell if it's pitting, not pitting, plus one, plus two, plus three. That's something we're not going to really get into in this class, but you will in later courses if you continue. All right, so cardiac compromise is a life-threatening condition without question. Right, so here's something to think about. Why is it important to rapidly identify 
cardiac compromise. Uh, rapid identification and subsequent, subsequent treatment will help minimize heart damage. It's definitely a time-dependent emergency. If you can get ahead of the curve and realize the patient's having a heart attack and get them to the right facility, treatment can correct this issue and they won't have any long-lasting damage to the heart muscle at all. If you don't get them treated quickly, you can have lifelong issues. All right. Describe the difference between angina and AMI. Uh, so the signs and symptoms may not differ significantly. You never want to cancel the transport uh, transport unit with the paramedics on there just because you don't think they're having a heart attack. You think it's angina. Get somebody out there for a further eval uh, with more tools. And we generally want to just get these people to the hospital for a further evaluation. Let's talk about some emergency care for cardiac compromise. So you want to take appropriate standard precautions as always. You're going to perform a primary assessment in support of the ABCs. If you're allowed in your protocols, you're going to provide uh, supplemental oxygen. Your SpO2 or pulse oximeter, which I don't think you guys are going to be carrying, should be around 95 to 100. Um, if you've got somebody that you think's got some type of cardiac issue going on, you always just want to apply oxygen if you're able. All right, so here's something to think about. Why might it be beneficial to obtain medical history from a family member on scene rather than asking a patient with shortness of breath to respond? All right, so patients with shortness of breath are often uh, just having difficulty speaking in full sentences and talking can cause them unnecessary exertion and it just taxes their system even further. If somebody's truly having shortness of breath and you've got a wife or husband or somebody that knows their history, politely tell the patient, hey, I know you're having a hard time breathing. I'm going to try to get some of your information from your family member over here. It can just make it easier on them. All right, so after that, you're going to determine your chief complaint, onset, when did it start, provocation, does anything make it worse or better, quality, what does it feel like, uh, region and radiation, uh, where is it at and does it move anywhere? Severity, how bad is it? Generally, I'll say on a scale of 0 to 10, zero, 0 being no pain at all and 10 being the worst pain of your life. How does this rate? Um, time, when did this start? This is an algorithm for emergency care of a patient with signs and symptoms of cardiac compromise. Right, so you can start off with asking, does this patient has chest pain? All right. Next question is, is the primary assessment okay? If it's not, you're going to go into uh, BLS care up to your level of training. If the primary assessment is okay, you're going to move on to the secondary assessment. Then you're going to determine your priority. and You're going to reassess while you wait for additional responders to arrive. So you're going to provide emotional support and reassure the patient. You're going to allow the patient to maintain a position of comfort, usually sitting up. You're going to involve some. I mean, you're going to obtain some vital signs. All right. So why do you think it's important to ensure the patient does not exert themselves? All right. The heart tissue may be dying, and exertion such as walking or moving around can compromise the heart's performance even further, and it can accelerate the tissue death. All right, this is the algorithm for assessment of patients with chest pain. The right, first question is, does the patient have chest pain? The answer is yes. Uh, you're going to put them in a position of comfort. Generally, that's going to be sitting up. You're going to keep the patient at rest and reassure them. You're going to ask if the patient has medication. If they do have the medication, you're going to assist with the meds if it's appropriate. If not, just continue to monitor. Um, after you assist with the meds, you're going to reassess the patient, and you're also going to just continue to monitor vital signs. If you're helping them with their nitroglycerin, just keep in mind that it can cause their blood pressure to drop, especially if they're having certain types of myocardial infarctions. So just be aware of that and be prepared that you may have to treat them for something completely different if they are going to take their nitroglycerin. 
All right, so you're going to assist the patient with a prescribed dose of nitroglycerin if your protocols permit. Uh, you just have to follow your local protocols on that. Uh, you're going to consult emergency. Uh, I mean, you're going to consult medical direction if required. You're also just going to continue to monitor your vital signs. All right, so nitroglycerin uh, commonly comes in tablets, spray, and paste. It'll be prescribed for angina or previous MI. Its function is to dilate blood vessels and allow blood to flow through vessels that were once constricted. It decreases the blood pressure and reduces the uh, preload or cardiac workload. Dizziness and a feeling of lightheadedness are common side effects. And like I said, you're just going to have to assist your patient according to your local protocols. Uh, different places have different protocols. All right, it is helpful to ask if the patient has taken nitroglycerin or aspirin, you know, before you arrive. Even if your local protocol does not allow you to assist with administration of these drugs, the information that you've gathered should be relayed to EMS so they don't repeat um, the dose of the medications if it's not necessary. This is an image showing nitroglycerin or nitrostat uh, as a common brand that most people use the little tiny pills under the bottle are what they look like and they're going to be placed under the patient's tongue and allowed to dissolve you'd call this a sublingual route of administration this is nitroglycerin spray you're going to spray it directly under the tongue it's uh doesn't have to dissolve so a lot of times it's well it's at least thought to get into the bloodstream quicker it's gonna have the same effect as those little pills we just saw and some other medications are aspirin it's an analgesic uh, it's not really going to cause any relief of pain in a myocardial infarction or um, angina it is a clot inhibitor. It is not a clot buster. Okay, so it will make a keep a clot from getting worse, but it's not going to break it up. It can be prescribed prescribed daily uh, for patients with angina. It's beneficial for patients exhibiting signs and symptoms of an MI, mostly because it's a clot inhibitor. All right, uh, you can assist your patient with aspirin according to your protocol. Some places allow you to assist, some places do not. You just have to know your local protocols. All right, so here's some things to think about. What does time is muscle mean? All right, so when we're talking about time as muscle, we're talking about the time from the onset of a myocardial infarction or heart attack. And the muscle we're referring to is the myocardium or the muscle in the heart. So the longer that the blood flow is blocked to a particular section of the heart, um, the more muscle is going to be um, injured to a point that is going to cause it uh, to die. So the longer t the time it takes to get this blockage cleared at the receiving facility, the more muscle is going to die and the less... Um, the patient's going to have permanent damage. All right, so performing a thorough assessment and appropriate treatment can tr contribute to how well the patient recovers from cardiac compromise. If you assess your patient well and you can figure out what's going on and start treatment, let the uh, other responders know what's going on. It can just be huge in the final outcome. Emergency medical responders make a difference. Uh, you're the first person arriving on the scene. You can recognize what's going on. In more rural areas, you can get with EMS and find out if they're going to want to transport this individual by ground or if you want to go ahead and maybe start getting some air medical en route. Um, it's just something that you can give them a heads up. Hey, I think this patient might have, might be a, experiencing symptoms of cardiac compromise and when you get here we need to figure it out all right let's get into a summary of this chapter all right a healthy car heart is the uh, core of the cardiovascular system blood flows through the heart in a precise way electrical impulses flow along the conduction pathway there are key signs and symptoms of cardiac compromise that we discuss in this chapter 
angina results from a diminished uh, supply of oxygenated blood to the heart. The myocardial infarction occurs when a portion of the heart dies due to the inadequate blood supply. Congestive heart failure is caused by a weakened heart and can no longer pump blood efficiently. Care for uh, cardiac compromise includes the ABCs, supplemental oxygen, obtaining a thorough medical history, keeping the patient at rest, monitoring vital signs, also assisting patients with their medications if your protocol allows. And you also need to make sure you got a paramedic coming out to your scene, uh, which in this particular county, all the units are ALS units, so you will have a paramedic coming. Right, let's go over some review questions. All right, so describe the normal flow of blood through the heart. All right, so blood flows through the heart beginning at the right atrium. It flows down into the right ventricle. There it goes to the lungs where it drops off carbon dioxide and it's going to pick up some oxygen. It returns from the lungs and enters the left atrium. Then it flows down into the left ventricle. The left ventricle is the largest and strongest chamber of the heart and must force blood out to the entire body. The heart muscle itself receives blood supply from tiny vessels called the coronary arteries. So your heart receives blood independently from the rest of the body. Now, what are some vague symptoms of MI that may be seen in women or their elderly? Uh, during a cardiac event, some of these populations may experience what appear to be flu-like symptoms such as nausea, vomiting, or indigestion, or a feeling of general weakness. The patient may simply feel, yeah, I don't feel good. Something is wrong with me, but I don't know what it is. Uh, what's the appropriate assessment and care for a patient experiencing cardiac compromise? Uh, you're going to want to go through your OPQRST, which we covered in the last chapter. This is going to be onset, provocation, quality, region or radiation, severity and time. Um, you just want to go through that very thoroughly and it can provide a wealth of information for you. Right, this is going to conclude chapter 14 hope you guys enjoyed it as you can see this is a lot more information uh, in the last couple chapters that than there was in previous chapters spend an appropriate amount of time going through this and you'll do just fine if you have any questions please touch base with me of the alveolar membrane results in flooding of the alveoli and pulmonary edema of pain despite the nitroglycerin Sometimes they try to ignore the symptoms. It is imperative to seek medical help immediately.